actually it was um okay yes i'll just say it I was again. actually Welcome thinking Mac. Uh, i will hand oh. it over to you in just a second and go ahead yeah Oh, thanks, Johan. I was actually just thinking about this crossing scales thing this morning, and um, I was uh, I was making so uh, making some barbecue. My wife's Texan, so I have to barbecue all the time. Um, uh, and so I was making some ribs, and we always make coleslaw to go with the ribs, and you have to put a bit of white sugar in, and one of the little grains of white sugar fell down onto the counter, and I was like, man, I wonder how many uh, molecules of glucose are in that little thing, and it turns out that the number is just like astronomically large, right? It's like some millions of millions of millions of, of uh, molecules of glucose in a little cube, a little grain of sugar. And I think it's like, it's, it's rare that we come across those moments that just like shatter our illusion that we have everything kind of like vaguely in mind, but that's like the most astronomically large number you can imagine, right? And it's in this tiny little thing in front of your eyes. And the brain is kind of the same, right? There's like this exquisite detail down in the microstructure and the nanostructure. And yet when we do brain imaging experiments, we get, you know, millimeters and, and centimeters of activity, you know, bold blood flow, or we get an ERP or something like that. And we try to convince ourselves that we have some handle on this vast distance between this tiny micro scale and this massive macro scale. Um, so I am well aware that the things that I um, attempt to do uh, are absolutely delusional. There's no link between those things. They're so far apart in terms of orders of magnitude difference. But if we don't do those things, then we are kind of inextricably linked to our area, right? We are either down in the micro looking at cell A or cell B and finding some tiny difference, or we're up at the macro level and just sort of describing patterns. And so I think that that dialogue is necessary if we're going to really make progress um, in terms of understanding how the nervous system kind of does what it does. Um, I know that's kind of uh, lip service, but I just thought it was kind of a fun example of how um, we can kind of be have our minds blown in our kitchen. Um, all right, so let me share my screen. Um, here we go. Awesome. So um, a couple of weeks ago, we were chatting uh, on this meeting and talking about um, various things, neuromodulation, the topic of neuromodulation came up and um, I was given the uh, inevitable task of trying to summarize uh, some ideas about neuromodulation uh, and the way that neuromodulatory, um, the neuromodulatory system might kind of impact the system's level organization of the brain. Um, and that is a very, very, very big topic. I don't think I'll uh, surprise anyone by trying to make that claim. So rather than trying to be exhaustive and describe every last study out there on neuromodulation and describe every subtype of receptor in the neuromodulatory system in the brain, I'm going to try to do a bit of a kind of bird's eye view sort of um, perspective on the arousal system. And I'll highlight a bunch of work that we've done in my lab, but also a bunch of work that I'm, I really find quite um, uh, inspiring and also kind of um, intuition building from a bunch of researchers around the world. Um, please, please, please stop me at any point in time. Um, I, I, you know, I've tried to cover a lot of ground here and so we may not get through everything and I'm more than happy to kind of um, field questions and take in in different directions if people would like. Um, but yeah, so just wanted to give that caveat at the top that if, I for, if I've forgotten your favorite sub receptor, just yell at me and I can maybe rack my brain to see if I've, I've thought about things um, on, 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 that, on that dimension. Um, so why have I got this picture of a brain in a, in a weird, um, from a weird perspective that we don't probably typically look at. This is a human brain and it's viewed from the inferior surface. And we typically look at a brain like this. Um, in fact, this is this cool thing I just found in, in PowerPoint. Also, I'll, I'll just unshare my slides quickly. Um, they have this, this little thing now, which is like this little 3D model of a brain that you can like twist and turn around, which I think is pretty neat. Um, and so, right, we normally look at a brain, something like this, and if we're, um, you know, the majority of, of neuroscientists, at least in my world of, of whole brain imaging, we only sort of look at everything in the cortex. We kind of ignore the cerebellum and the brainstem. Um, but if you, if you take the brain then and kind of twist it around, you kind of remind yourself that there's this incredibly important set of structures down here, deep in the arousal system. that are extremely highly conserved, right? We're looking at the big sort of pontine bulge here, but just right behind that, all these structures that um, highly conserved and they project out in a very different way to the rest of the nervous system um, than a lot of the other structures that we typically focus on in the cerebral cortex. Um, and so I wanna try and kind of pump your intuition today about what kinds of 
costs and benefits come from that kind of organization. And really at the whole, at the sort of whole brain level, we really think of the arousal system as kind of um, uh, sort of changing, like, acting like a control parameter for the system. It's, it's giving the system flexibility. And so wh why is that important? So let me, let me share my slides again. Um, so a lot of studies that you see in, um, in sort of systems level neuroscience will focus on, not my MATLAB, but will focus on um, the structural topology. So that means they'll take an individual, uh, let's say in this case, this is um, individual neurons within the mouse brain, and they'll put a viral, tract, uh, tr viral tracer into each of the neurons, and then they'll work out where, where else in the brain, in this case, the cortex, um, the, the connections of that individual neuron went to. And they'll go through and they'll sort of map out one of these um, matrices that you, you may have seen in, in different studies. So um, the heat on this matrix tells you something about the likelihood of there being a connection between two nodes. You notice that the nodes here on the left are in the descending rows and the columns are identical. So what you can do is if you want to read something like this out, you can say, okay, I care about an area in the somatosensory cortex. Let's go see whether or not it's got a connection to the visual cortex. Okay, that's not particularly strong, but maybe if we're in the visual cortex, that has a strong connection with other visual cortical regions. And so you can sort of get an idea about the kind of topology, the structure, the sort of routes, the highways between different regions. Um, but one inherent problem with that is that the system um, essentially is, is, is hardwired, is fixed. There's no way to sort of essentially grab off part of the network that you might like in a particular context and use it for adaptive function and not some other part. In, in, in other words, let's say that I've learned in a particular context, like um, when my wife's cooking, I can smell some nice food. Um, if I'm hungry, I wanna go and find that food. But if I've just eaten, that food should have a different kind of a signal. It should have a different kind of a salience for me. So I wanna be able to use this hardwired structured connectome in a flexible dynamic way that's dependent on my needs. Um, so a, a way to kind of think about the sort of extremes uh, of, of this idea is that you can imagine like lots of different ways that the network could be then configure it, configured. So instead of just having this sort of structural connectome backbone, now what you can do is you can start to bring certain elements of that connectome online together. You can make subsets active and diminish other sets. Let's say dampen 80%, but bring 20% online. And th that bringing the, that 20% subset could be really crucial for a particular function. Um, so an idea here would be something like you've got this segregated backbone on the left of a bunch of different highly connected regions. Imagine this one's the visual, this is the somatosensory I showed you before, they're not particularly connected. But maybe if I wanna track some uh, visual input and then move my hand to reach it, maybe I need to then start to have these systems coordinate. So I need to bring them online together and, and have their functions become uh, sort of uh, in, interactive. Um, we would call this sort of integrated in, in, the, in, the, in the parlance of network topology. So if you do these kinds of analyses of thinking about the network structure on, on tasks, uh, this is a, a cognitive task called the NBAC task. It's a sort of, um, sort of mainstay of cognitive neuroscience where people view a stream of images and they have to tell you whether or not the image they just saw was the same as the one they saw N back. So that could be something really easy like the previous image, that would be one back, or it could be really hard like four back. So now all of a sudden you've got to keep track of all these images and also then uh, determine whether or not the one you've just seen is like the one you saw four back and not like the one three, two or one back. It gets really, really hard the, the higher you go. And it turns out that if we do these kinds of network level um, analyses on, on these kinds of data sets, we do find that the structural connectome, which I've represented in this sort of weird jangly graph on the right is, is reconfiguring over time. You, you don't see this one static architecture that's in the data all the time. You essentially see the network reconfiguring um, so that the different elements of the system putatively can come together and form. Uh, into so, novel coalitions. Um, so it seemed like you you uh, switched between like a directive representation and and a, and a non-directed, undirected yes. representation. Yes, 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 I did. And okay. that's because directed representations in the human brain are not something we should try to do um, without, <laughs> uh, without our sort of, um, without a lot of cynicism. It's, very, it's just a very, very hard problem from neuroimaging data to get um, directed um, edges. That's not to say you can't do it. There are very sophisticated mathematical techniques that are quite good, but they're really, um, really good for uh, either having really long recordings or for having very small numbers of nodes in a network. And the problem just becomes extremely difficult to do. So I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to hoodwink you there. Just we don't typically do that just because it's a really hard problem mathematically. Um, so when we done, uh, when we did this work uh, back in my postdoc, um, we, we got these results, these sort of reconfigurations in the network. And we really sort of scratched our head for a long time thinking, what kinds of 
um, biological mechanisms could give rise to this flexibility, this sort of fluid interaction in the kind of network structure and how it could reconfigure um, uh, in these different cognitive contexts. Um, and the topic of the lecture um, probably gives away the clue here, which is that we eventually stumbled on this idea, which I think is a really fascinating concept and something to really kind of drill down into, which is that the ascending neuromodulatory arousal system is sort of essentially really well set up to, to sort of buy a system, the kinds of f flexible dynamic capacities that we're looking for, for this functional reconfiguration. So this figure is from some seminal work. Uh, it's from a review paper, but refer referring back to the seminal work by Eve Marder and colleagues, where they essentially took um, what's a, a very um, simple little neural circuit in the stomatic gastric ganglion of, 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 a, of a lobster, which is essentially this tiny little circuit of three different neurons that it controls peristalsis. So whether or not the animal will cause the contractile waves in their stomach to start to digest food. Um, and what they essentially do there, they can pull out this little stomatic gastric ganglion, keep it alive, and they can start to identify, okay, neuron A has got a connection to B and B to C, and then B and C have got a, a gap junction together. And they can start to work out the kinds of rhythms that can come out of this very simple circuit. And one of the really fascinating things that um, even colleagues did was that they, show, they basically used a huge number of different neuromodulatory chemicals to essentially like manipulate the outputs of this circuit. So if they put in some octopamine and, and change the temperature so just so, all of a sudden they would get these really abrupt changes in the output of the circuit, rather than having, um, let's say rhythmic oscillations that were consistent with parasolsis, you'd start to get desynchronized behavior. But then if they turn down the octopamine, all of a sudden the system regains its sort of, um, uh, its emergent oscillatory sort of limit cycle behavior. So this is a sort of really intuitive way to link something that we've been talking about for a long time about these dynamical systems and bifurcations to something uh, that uh, a biological implementation of these. And so, um, the, you know, this is really seminal work. I, I'm not gonna be able to cover that in, in, in great detail, but essentially that was the sort of uh, often very intuitive starting point that small changes in the addition of these neuromodulatory ligands and chemicals or other things like temperature or pH can, can change the, um, the emergent output of a system um, quite abruptly. So in the human, uh, in the human brain, the neuromodulatory system um, is, is quite a deal more complex than in a lobster's stomatic gastric ganglion. And um, I don't, as I said before at the outset, I don't have the, the time uh, or, or really the expertise to kind of uh, overview all of the different neuromodulatory uh, chemicals that at least are sort of focused um, in, the, in the field at the moment. The four main ones that you'll typically hear about are uh, the uh, acetylcholine or the cholinergic system in green at the top left. Whoops, I don't know why I've got all these auto things on. Um, uh, cholinergic system at the top left, uh, the noradrenergic system typically from the locus cerullus on the top right, the serotonergic system from the raphe nuclei, um, which sort of run up and down the brainstem like a seam uh, next to the um, ventricular um, canal and the dopaminergic system. Now I put the dopaminergic system on the bottom right because it's by far the most popular one of these. And so we should like do our best to um, put it in the corner and remove it from being popular and give some of the spotlight to the other interesting systems. Um, so in particular, I really like the noradrenergic system. That's the one that I've spent the most time thinking about, but I've done then quite recently, we've been thinking a lot more about the opponency and cooperation between the cholinergic and the noradrenergic systems. Um, in part because uh, there's a really sort of in intuitive link here where the cholinergic system is the main effector of the parasympathetic nervous system in the body. And the noradrenergic system is the main effector of the sympathetic nervous system. And those two are essentially typically kind of in, um, in balance with one another. You can think about it as the fight or flight system on the right, um, and then the rest and digest system on the left. And so there's this really intuitive link that uh, a lot of um, physiological processes have this opponency. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm gonna basically do uh, sort of today is walk through some of the mechanisms by which these systems work uh, at the microcircuit level, and then try to kind of pinpoint what I think are some interesting studies in each of those four different domains. And then at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about their combination. So what happens when acetylcholine and noradrenaline are gonna battle against one another, or if dopamine and acetylcholine get into the basal ganglion, what does that do? Um, really to kind of give you a, a bird's eye view of some of the ways that this system um, might, might be functioning. All right. Um, and yeah, as I said before, I'm not covering all of them. So histamine, substance P, neuropeptide Y, uh, um, uh, hypocretin. There's so many other ones that if you're interested, you can go off and read and try to work out which ways are these similar or different to the, the systems that I'm giving you a bit of an overview on now. So 
one fascinating thing about these um, these chemicals is that they tend to have a very similar um, mechanism of action in within neurons. And so this is a little cartoon from a recent review we, we wrote that kind of tries to give you the intuition here. Um, the idea is that they're changing what we would call the neural gain of the system in, in a lot of cases. And so what, what does that mean? The neural gain is essentially how much bang do you get for your buck? If you're going to get an input to the cell, uh, how much does how likely is it to get translated into an output? So in this little cartoon here, we've got uh, a, a little spike train um, coming in on this um, uh, this synapse here in blue, and then one little additional red input here um, on, on another synapse. And the idea is that um, at, at the at the blue point, there's a certain sort of likelihood of that current getting turned into an output, and maybe that gives you one spike. But maybe just by kicking the system up just a little bit by adding just that little bit more current. Now what that does is it pushes the system into this um, uh, this regime where now much more output can come. You can imagine kicking a neuron closer to its threshold, and then you get this sort of nonlinear increase in the firing rate outputs uh, of the axon of that cell. Now, the way that these systems work, um, and I, here I'm focusing on what we would call the metabotropic receptors of the neuromodulatory system. There's also ionotropic receptors, which work much more quickly in um, process uh, ions much the same way that glutamate and gamma would, like NMDA or AMPA receptors. But the, the, the system that we really have spent a lot of time thinking about is the metabotropic system. So this is a, a G protein coupled system. You can see these little guys here in green and red. They've, the proteins here have, have got a transmembrane domain. So they sit sort of lodged in, in, the, in the membrane of a cell. They can be presynaptic or postsynaptic. And the idea is that these different cell types have got these little internal segments sitting on them that can be cleaved and then go off and have um, internal effects, what they call second messenger effects inside the cell. Um, now, the two main classes of these types of G protein coupled receptors are the GQ class and a GS slash I slash O class. Um, now there's a lot of subtlety here, so I don't want to sort of smooth over so too much of the detail, but the basic idea and, and the kind of rule of thumb is that the GQ class uh, changes um, the internal environment such that you release calcium stores. So inside every neuron is, is a bunch of little vesicles in the endoplasmic and sarcoplasmic reticulum that are holding onto calcium. And calcium is really important because uh, it can really change the uh, internal state of the cell really, really quickly, right? It's a big, uh, you know, um, divalent cation. Um, it also turns out that you need to sequester this stuff because it really, really loves to interact with phosphate. And phosphate is, a, is sort of a ubiquitous, ubiquitous um, feature of many different biological proteins. And so if you don't sequester this stuff, it loves to go off and make a salt. Um, and also, uh, if you think about it, um, hydroxyapatite, the, um, the chemical that make the composition of our bone is actually a, a combination of calcium and potassium in, in, with a few other little extras in it. So this, this, you know, these chemicals love to make salts and you've got to keep them separate. So if you keep them separate, what you've actually done is you bought yourself the ability to, in particular contexts, release a neurochemical that can come over here cleave some uh, internal structures like adenylid cyclase, which can then go and um, uh, liberate calcium. Oh, sorry, uh, P PKC, I apologize. They can liberate calcium and then change the internal state of the cell. Um, in contrast, these GI and GS proteins have a slightly more subtle effect. They change the likelihood of, uh, of expressing and, um, and opening voltage-gated channels uh, in, in the cell. So that has a slightly different effect than the calcium. Um, it, it's basically going to change the refresh rate and also sort of uh, determine whether, where the sort of membrane potential uh, of the cell lies. So, so what might that look like? So here's our little cartoon cell again. And if we had one of those GQ um, mechanisms here, if we were liberating calcium, here's our little, um, uh, you know, uh, Hodgkin-Huxley action potential um, curve. And what we can imagine then is that releasing the calcium is going to have the effect of raising the potential of the cell such that it's now much, much closer to its firing threshold and much more likely then to actually transmit an action potential. Um, if we sequester calcium, it'd have the opposite effect. We'll pull, pull that cell system down. So we could sort of think about that cell as sort of changing the excitability, uh, that mechanism of changing the excitability of one of these cells. Uh, in contrast, the GI and the GS mechanisms are going to be a little bit more subtle, as I mentioned. They're going to change, we think, the threshold of the cell. They're going to make it more or less likely for the cell to need that much more potential in order to um, fire an action potential um, or, or change the refractory period of the cell. So you can think about it like if a cell has fired an action potential, the amount of time it takes to then recycle the gradients that it was, it was using to, to, to find itself at that, um, at that resting potential 
um, are going to be either augmented, i.e. there's more channels there that it can quickly recycle, or made much more difficult by closing off those cycles. Now, so with those, those mechanisms in mind, you can then start to think about this sort of really fascinating um, diversity that we see in the receptor expression around the brain. So it turns out that um, alpha-2A receptors, in this case, are a GI type, and D1 receptors are a GS type. So D1 is a dopamine receptor, alpha-2A is, an, is an, um, an adrenergic receptor. And this is some really beautiful work from Amy Arnston. Um, I don't have time to, to cover it all, but she's basically um, uh, advocating for this idea that different concentrations of the receptors in different populations of cells can actually sort of be, uh, can actually change the functionality of the cell such that um, in, in particular states, let's say where both the chemicals weren't being released, there's a, there's a particular state of the system. But then as you start to add in the concentration of these different ligands, you can start to augment certain features like this sort of um, alpha 2A mechanism that might change the system so that you can uh, uh, function in a particular way. But then if you turn up the dopamine levels too high, now all of a sudden the D1 receptors start to come in and then overexcite the cell. And you can get things like a sort of frazzled or dissociative state. So th this is a really key kind of concept in neuromodulation that linearity is out the door, right? What you're looking at is these strongly non-linear systems with lots of feedback and lots of opponency built into them from the ground up. Um, so that's something that I just sort of wanted to, um, you know, uh, have our heads around um, from, from the early stage. Um, another sort of key feature of the neuromodulatory system is that not only are there different types of receptors, in this case, alpha 1A is a G, uh, Q, uh, sorry, yes, a GQ receptor and alpha 2A is a GI receptor. Um, they're also expressed in different layers of the cerebral cortex and also different subcortical structures um, to, di to different degrees. So this is some work from um, Nick Palomero Gallagher and Carl Zillis that shows that uh, what they essentially did was they, they took an autopsy human brain, they sliced it extremely, extremely thinly in, in lots of different locations down to the nanometer level. And then they put in different probes for different neuromodulatory receptors. They, they had mRNAs that could then uh, elicit um, uh, a signal whenever the um, receptor was present. And you can see just in, in this illustrative case, I think this is from sensory, sensory cortex, that the alpha 1A receptors are very highly expressed in these superficial layers of the cerebral cortex, as well as in a couple parts in, in the deep layers. Whereas these alpha 2A receptors are really expressed in the kind of layer three, um, sorry, the, the three should be, should be down there, uh, layer three and then sort of uh, the deep layer two. Now, um, also a little bit down in the sort of deeper layers of the cortex. Now, this level of complexity, I think is something that is a little dizzying at times. And it's also important to note that um, just because there's an expression in that layer doesn't mean that it's on excitatory cells. It could be on inhibitory populations. It could be on the dendrites of cells whose cell bodies, let's say, live down here, but have apical dendrites that project up. So you can't really use this, I think, to really directly read out exactly which cell populations are being uh, affected by the receptors. But you, I really just wanted to sort of expose to, to people this kind of complexity um, uh, of the kind of expression of the system. Are there, are there drugs um, that affect these particular receptors or are those like the, the are the drugs i'm thinking about different uh, different serotonin receptors yeah so in this case this is noradrenaline and um oh i'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no that's fine um so in this case noradrenaline um uh receptors have different efficacies for endogenous ligands so norepinephrine and adrenaline and epinephrine or noradrenaline adrenaline are the sort of two main ligands uh that are endogenous in the body but you can also these receptors are not sufficiently selective that they wouldn't take dopamine or serotonin in a pinch or other chemicals a little bit like them. So they, these all have the sort of efficacy of different ranges for different ligands. And then there's also kind of artificial ligands like guanfacine is an example of a, of a, of a drug that is selective for alpha 2A receptors. Um, and dexmedetomidine, the common anesthetic agent is really, really selective for the alpha 2 receptor, uh, particularly the, the subtype that's expressed in the brainstem. So there's, there are very specific ligands for these receptors, but there's also kind of this notion that generally most locks in, this, in the central nervous system are kind of open to lots of different keys. There's, there's sort of not really a one-to-one -one correspondence a lot, a lot of the time. Makes it even more complicated, unfortunately. Um, so, so I showed you some, um, some you know, micro, micro expression in the receptors, some mesoscopic expression in the layers. There's also regional heterogeneity here. Um, so this is a, a map um, that is from uh, the Allen Brain Atlas. So what they did here is in um, six individuals that were autopsied, they went through at a coarser resolution than the German group, 
uh, and did mRNA gene chip expression of these diff uh, of a range of different genes. Uh, and then this is just the relative expression of the alpha-1 receptor I showed you here and the alpha-2 receptor. And so you can imagine then sort of individual differences in, in the extent of this expression. So here, highest in uh, visual cortices, but also quite uh, more expressed in prefrontal cortices and the insula than say the alpha-1, which is now much more in the sort of sensory regions uh, and down into the kind of posterior cingulate and the um, in the hippocampus. That there's these really interesting differences in the regional expression, which can play into the heterogeneity. Um, just to give you some confidence that there's some logic here, um, in, a, in some work that I did uh, with Russ Poldrack, Michael Breakspear a couple of years ago, we, we performed a, a dimensionality reduction of um, human brain imaging data, bold data across multiple different tasks. And we essentially found that you could use a very small number of components to describe most of what was happening in these different tasks. And it turned out that um, the majority of movement, those first two principal components, which explained approximately sort of 40% of the variance, the expression of these different receptor types was strongly related to, to this, this low dimensional space, such that neuromodulatory receptors that have been associated with facilitating cognition in the past, so guanfacine augmenting alpha 2A or dopamine 1 receptors, 5-HT2A, unless you take heroic doses of LSD, you can um, uh, facilitate cognition in M1, were actually associated with positive movement in this low dimensional uh, domain, whereas other drugs, re other receptors that have been shown to impair cognitive function, like the alpha 1A receptor, the dopamine 2 receptor associated with the indirect pathway of the basal ganglia, and the 5-HT1A receptor were associated with negative loading. They were more expressed in regions that were not used in the different tasks. And so the, the intuitive um, notion there is that- Mac, uh, so, yes. so what this, what's the feature set that you used to, uh, for these data points? Oh, I can unpack. I wanted to just give you a very, very um, brief foray into this. Um, okay. we, we take blood flow data across multiple different cognitive tasks, and we fit a principal component analysis to that. So we're basically asking how, what, what, um, what low dimensional embedding could we create such that we could exp express most of the variants of this data set? And it turns out that the maps of that expression correspond to the kinds of places where these different neuromodulatory receptors are expressed, or at least were expressed in six people at autopsy. So the idea would be something like, if you wanted to do something cognitive, if you released enough noradrenaline or dopamine or 5-HT to uh, 5-HT or, or acetylcholine, and into the locations that uh, were in the sort of prefrontal cortex, the parietal lobe, you can now push the system uh, as like a control parameter into the state that would allow you to perform the cognitive function. And now when you're done, maybe you turn up the volume even higher of that noradrenaline, and now you start to hit the low affinity alpha-1 receptors, that pulls you out of that state, allows you to switch into a new cognitive state. This is the intuitive concept um, behind the kind of this idea of the sort of neuromodulation of this sort of uh, large scale neural dynamics. All right, um, so let me jump then a couple of slides because I think this stuff is probably um, a little bit uh, to the side. So the neurogenergic system, as I mentioned before, um, is, is a system that I've uh, spent a lot of time thinking about. And probably my favorite uh, way to think about it comes from some work um, from Sarah and Bure. Um, so S Susan Sarah has this really lovely notion that she calls a network reset. And the idea is that if an animal wants to be adapted to its environment, it can't overfit to its environment. If it's decided that right now is um, the time to get food and it makes the incorrect assessment that the rustle in the bushes was just the wind and not a tiger trying to eat it, it's not gonna last very long. And so, so Susan Sarah's idea was maybe what the system needs is the ability to know when it's time to erase the blackboard and focus on a new attractor to basically take the active network and erase it so that you can focus on the new most salient inputs. And so the idea here would be, imagine that there's, a, there's an animal here with some uh, network of neural regions, some subset of which are active, and there's some shift in the stimulus. Let's say they were eating, but then they hear that rustling in the bushes. If their network was ignoring those inputs, if the gain on those inputs was sufficiently low, the animal might just keep on doing what it was doing. It might allow the time scale of the system of these green nodes just to continue on. And that could be very uh, maladaptive. And so what Susan argues is that you should get a phasic burst in noradrenaline, which can then increase the gain of the system, right? It increase the excitability, release calcium, uh, which could then uh, make all of the parameter neurons in the system very active. And what that'll have the effect of doing is reducing the benefit, uh, the sort of um, advantage that this green subset over here had and making it such that the new subset, along with a couple others that let's say weren't 
um, uh, brought along for the ride, much more active. They can sort of uh, respond now to their inputs. And now the animal has this capacity to respond to the new set of inputs. Um, and so in other words, one of the main benefits of noradrenaline is this ability to reconfigure coalitions of neurons such that they are fit to the current context. Um, now, obviously this, this um, analogy, uh, this mechanism is, is in the context of sensory inputs, but I think it also makes a lot of intuitive sense for different kinds of cognitive contexts. So if I was um, in a particular cog cognitive context, which allowed me to interpret an item uh, let's say in a particular a particular way, let's say I'm looking at a NECA cube and I'm thinking of it as popping out rather than going in. You can imagine now that there's now some balance and, and competition between my sensory inputs coming in and my cognitive biases coming down. And the idea is that noradrenaline is able to essentially alter in a really kind of global sense, how much the network is, is reconfigured according to whether or not you've got a top down influence or that bottom up influence um, of the signal. And so, if we map this back to the idea that I mentioned before from Amy Arnstein, we could think of a um, of sort of locus surrealis activity, right? The main um, structure that's projecting noradrenaline out to the, to, the, um, to the central nervous system as kind of controlling the network architecture. So maybe if we're inattentive now, we've basically got um, not enough noradrenaline to basically keep us uh, you know, um, uh, embedded within the environment. But if we have too much noradrenaline, now we've increased the gain too far. Now all of the system is, is basically frazzled because you've got too much communication. There's not enough nuance to, to, the, to the activity. But right in that intermediate zone um, is, is where we think the, the balance is just right, where you've got enough um, a sort of uh, excitability in the system such that you can create novel coalitions that fit to the context, that fit to the current information that's provided to you by the world or the current items that you would like from the world, um, but not so many that you basically kind of um, diminish uh, uh, the, the kind of information processing capacity of the system. So um, I thought it might be kind of helpful to, to walk through um, a, a little computational model that we ran um, to try to kind of decrease uh, our uncertainty about some of this stuff. So. In, in this case, we used the virtual brain, which is a, a really nice um, set of software if you're not um, uh, you know, uh, well-versed in, in creating your own models from scratch. And the idea is that the virtual brain is a sort of set of different um, uh, sort of common models that people use in the community to model neural dynamics, baked into a, an engine like a virtual machine that lets you, lets you run various parameter sweeps and alterations of the model uh, in your particular context in other words, it sort of lets you um, go and run these experiments on your own without needing to, um, to, to be able to sort of build the, the whole system from scratch. Um, and so what we were interested in doing in, in this study um, with, uh, with, with Russ Poldrack and, and Michael Brakespear um, uh, and Matt Aburn, uh, what, we, what we did here is took a really, really simple biophysical model. In this case, it's a, a little generic two-dimensional two oscillator that has a slow and a fast variable. You can think about it a little bit like a souped up Kurumoto uh, model where its, its functions are whether it's either to oscillate or to basically remain um, quiet. And then we had uh, a directed connectome, which we took from the macaque brain uh, from the Kokomak database. And we had this neural gain parameter, um, which is essentially that, um, that little thing I showed you before, the, the far, you could think about the, that little um, gamma curve that I showed with the little um, blue input kicking, the, the, the red input kicking the neuron up that curve. You could think about this as the, um, as the integral of that, right? It's the, the sigmoid curve and the derivative would give you that, that gamma function of major change around that point. And so what we did is we took this, um, this sort of setup and we manipulated this neural gain parameter. And then what we did is we translated the outputs of this model into the kinds of time series that we were recording um, uh, from the brain in, for example, in that NBAC context. And then we were able to calculate those graphs that I mentioned before to try to sort of make a link between this kind of micro scale property of, of neural gain, or maybe it's a meso scale property of neural gain modulation, and the kinds of measures that we can um, assess when we're actually seeing someone uh, and having them perform a task in a scanner. But the real goal here, right, is to, is to take elements of the biophysical model and to link them to the kinds of things that we can measure, right? Well, what we'd really like to do is to be able to say, someone had an integrated brain network in this context, and it might be because the biophysical model moved uh, in such a way such that the system had a configuration at the micro scale. Um, we manipulated um, the gain curve in two particular ways. I've, I've talked to you a little bit about um, this idea of sort of flattening um, uh, the gain curve with, with noradrenaline, um, but uh, we, we can also kind of imagine increasing the excitability. So you could think about this as a little bit like the GQ mechanism here, like releasing calcium 
shifting the, the output of the curve. It'll also have an effect of shifting the curve to the left as well. Um, and this neural gain parameter is more like the GSGI measure, which is going to kind of steepen or flatten this kind of um, input output curve. And so we now have this, this two dimensional parameter space. We have the excitability term uh, on the on the x-axis and the um, the gain term on the y-axis. And when we calculated our network measure, we found this uh, sort of very complicated uh, nonlinear uh, effect. So it wasn't like increasing neural gain just sort of caused integration in the network at this top level and segregation at the bottom level. There's all these sort of weird little pockets where at certain levels of excitability, increasing the neural gain can actually be a, um, a problem. It can actually cause the network to segregate, again, at high levels of excitability. But right in this middle zone, there's this, there's this region of increased integration. Um, and so to try to understand what was happening down at the, at the kind of microscopic level, we then looked at the phase portraits of these different, um, these different neurons. And if you, if you, um, if you see, as, as you watch, this is what we're doing here is we're manipulating now the values of the sigma parameter, right? This, this, we're moving up the y-axis. And you can see that right at the point around, I think it's around 0.3 of there, 0 0.4, 5, 0 0.5, you can see a real fundamental change in the, in the configuration of the network. So you can think about these here as the, the parameters that define the state space of, of these individual neural populations. And you get this big emergent change um, that, that is quite abrupt right at, that, right at that midpoint. And so we can quantify that with something. Mac, is, is there yes. inhibition in the model? Um, the inhibition in the model is baked into the equations, um, but there are no inhibitory populations. It's very, very simple. So um, we can quantify that, um, that change that I just showed you in the little picture via using phase synchrony order, right? So you basically look now to see as these little populations are oscillating, are they oscillating in phase or out of phase? And you can see this um, really abrupt change where at, lo at lots of different combinations of the neural gain and excitability, you see quite low uh, order, but then right across this really uh, sharp boundary, there's a big increase in, in the order of the system. Um, and so if we then go and take this point here, this, this alteration in uh, neural gain, the increase in neural gain around this switch point uh, from low order to high order, and reorganize our um, uh, integration um, measure, we essentially see this, um, this, this, fun, this big increase uh, right around that switch point um, so between- Is this, this is a, this is order, this is order parameter uh, sort of? Uh, this, yes. Uh, okay, okay. So we, um, we took the order parameter and we used it to define the point at which we interrogated the network. And we found that sure. the topology around that point at multiple different values of the excitability parameter was consistent with the shift from segregation to integration. So in other words, if you would, if the system had not enough excitability or too much excitability, you really wouldn't get the phenomena. But right at that intermediate zone of excitability, now the system was poised such that it could create this switch between segregation and integration. Um, um, okay. Yeah, was that Rob? Did you have a question? Yeah, kind of. Um, so if I remember right, the um, the order parameter. If you have like a like 180 degree base locking, then you wind up with a with zero like as the as that order parameter. Um, mm -hmm. So um, like my I guess my question is like, have you have you tried to, to uh, um, distinguish between um, you know just like like absolutely random sort of uh, activity and like base lock behavior essentially? Yeah, so uh, part of, this is where the simplicity of the model rendered that question um, kind of uh, like, I, I, okay, so I think that question is actually super interesting. And if you think about the dimensionality of the, the cerebral cortex and the thalamocortical system, when you, in, when you increase the complexity, let's say you took, it, took into account those really fascinating um, interneurons that you were talking about with different uh, matrix thalamic uh, projections that could have you know, different timing. I think you could you could imagine lots of scenarios where there's really important um, delays between regions and important phase locking versus complete phase decoupling. But in our case, the the generic to the oscillator really doesn't have that um, that much complexity in it, and the lags in the system and it's such a, it was such a small system was so small that we essentially just saw phase locking. So we didn't see the we didn't see really any anti phase. The system basically acts a lot like a Kuramoto 
um, model that's post uh, uh, supercritical and just sort of either oscillates as a group or separates out to not oscillating at all together. Um, but it's a really great question that you could you could probably look at with much much more sophisticated models. And and do they all have the same uh, oscillatory uh, frequency? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a uh, I believe it's an alpha frequency um, by construction. It's a, so the the particular model was a um, uh, like a reduction of the Wilson Cowan model. Um, and I can I can dig up the details for for those of you that um, that spend way more time than I do thinking about the, the subtleties there and to see whether or not there's something uh, that could be kind of pulled apart there. But really what we were trying to do is sort of test our intuition that changing this sort of temp this um, coupling parameter, this gain uh, parameter could give rise to the kinds of phenomena that we'd seen in neuroimaging, even at that really abstract level. And, and this was, you, you didn't have any thalamic uh, or subcortical connections, right? Just no, no, this was a super simple cortico-cortical network with sort of sparse con connectivity from this CocoMac database, which is this uh, sort of um, open source uh, database where people have kind of collapsed down uh, all the different sort of viral track tracing studies that were done um, in, uh, in, in macaque. There, there's much more sophisticated versions now, like the, <laughs> like the mouse one I showed you before. And this this is still in the context of, of like norepinephrine or yeah so um that's what we so I, I realized that when one of the slides that i skipped before um for for the uh trying to be um brief was trying to make this argument more explicitly that um the way that nor noradrenaline or norepinephrine for you north americans would alter the system is by uh changing this the slope of the um of the gain curve so what it's going to do is basically take a gain curve from uh, being kind of, you know, like a little um, uh, linear link between low, low inputs, low firing, high inputs, high firing. And it's going to steepen that, uh, that curve such that now intermediate inputs now have a really big uh, disproportionate output than they would have had before. Um, and so what we were trying to do is basically take that intuition and put it into a really simple model to try to work out whether or not the kinds of things that we thought might be happening mechanistically, at least at that mesoscale level, could give rise to the kinds of things that we can measure like that reconfiguration of networks that I was talking about at the start um, in the different cognitive tasks. So, so would it be fair to say that the that when you change the, the those functions using the norepinephrine manipulation, that what you're effectively doing is changing how the region responds to its uh, inputs by kind of uh, pushing it towards like sort of highly not like it would look like a non-linearization. It looked like a sigmoid uh, rather than just a slope change. So, so you have areas that instead of just sort of summing their inputs are kind of more discreetly changing how they respond to an input is, is that does it look like that because you do have a sharp yes. change right yes so i think there's a lot of um subtlety here that we tried to unpack um in the review paper that i was mentioning because you really only change the right side of the gain curve rather than the left side of the gain curve if you're not firing at all getting you know not uh, not firing a little bit more doesn't really have an impact on the output of the system Whereas if you're already firing a little bit and now you are a bit more receptive to inputs and that little bit more likely to be uh, to translate that uh, input into an actual potential, then there's a sort of steepness that can occur. So it's a little bit like steepening the right half of a sigmoid curve, but leaving the left half alone. Um, right. But, but, but yes, the, I, I think and, that's and, the right intuition. So, but, but okay, I forgot what I was going to say. <clears throat> and because they're all oscillators with the same frequency, what that effectively does is just push the phase forward and backward, right? Yes. So, um, so depending on, so you could be at, at the sweet spot where things are aligned, or you could be sort of actively pushing away so that it's at ninety degrees or one hundred and eighty degrees out, mm -hmm, by mm -hmm. changing the the how it responds to its input. Yes, and so that's obviously an oversimplification uh, with respect to the kinds of dynamical pro uh, processes that we think are happening in a kind of more realistic. But you know, I, I, I like that kind that level of simplicity because it's a nice way to think about. We haven't talked about it yet, but you know the binding problem. But maybe that, more on that later. Yeah, well, maybe that'll come up in in the chat. I haven't got anything explicitly about that in this talk, but um, so let, let me just say this one more one thing, and then um, uh, I'll 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 sort of kick forward. Um, we did a study that that some people might be might be keen to kind of um, tie into some other stuff that that, that could be interested in um, with Joe Lizia at University of Sydney and. We got to talking about, um, you know, criticality and this idea of, of kind of control parameters having subtle changes in the control parameter, but large abrupt changes in an order parameter. Uh, 
and you know as a um person trained in you know medicine and neuroscience the concept of criticality was absolutely foreign to me and fascinating and you know i knew about water boiling um and you know um and uh, and you know magnets with temperature but i really had never thought about it um in the context of neuroscience um really you know uh for uh really deeply and then started chatting to joe when i moved to sydney and he said oh you know uh, criticality is this really pervasive feature in the information theory and um what we what they had seen in a bunch of um you know, different work that he's done is that as they took uh, really simple systems and manipulated um control parameters that changed the uh the order of those systems they saw this major change in the kind of modes of information processing that you could calculate using um, Shannon's uh, theory of, 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 ent of entropy and, um, or of information as um, the reduction of uncertainty. And so what we essentially did was we took the, now not the bold series, we took the original sort of um, neural uh, time series from this model, and we calculated two different measures that, that Joe's interested in. Um, it, basically, they, they come from a partial information decomposition of the time series. And so what you try to do is you try to ask, how much did the information that I had in a certain region reduce my uncertainty about the future of that region. So that would be in blue. And they call that the active information storage. So the idea being that if I knew a little bit about the time series in this first blue window, and, I, and it told me a little bit about what was happening in the future, I, I had reduced my uncertainty, then there's a lot of information storage in that, in that signal. And then the, the idea, if you then make it bivariate, is that if you had information in the, um, or if you had knowledge of the red region and that reduced your uncertainty about the blue region, then you could say that there was a transfer entropy between those two regions, a little bit like um, causal information linking the two. And so what Joe basically did was then take this neural, this neural data and translate it into these two different measures. And if we then look at the data across that same boundary I showed you before, um, you see this uh, really stark um, change in, in the, uh, the uh, average information storage versus the average transfer entropy. So the idea being that as we increase and decrease this gain term, and admittedly in this really simple uh, generic to the oscillator model, what we're really doing is we're sort of shifting the network from an, uh, a mode in which it's really obsessed with itself, right? Where the blue, uh, you can predict your own future based on the uh, activity of, the, uh, of your own self, but to a system where you're now under the influence of uh, many other different areas and regions. And so now uh, we think that that actually might be a really fundamental um, a computational benefit of having a system organized such that it can take advantage of these different kind of processing modes for different ends. Um, I'm going to skip forward a bit. Would it be uh, fair oh, to sorry. say, so just to translate that into kind of more physics-y language, would it be fair to say that active information storage is a bit like hysteresis, where the system or, or even like a working mem memory and that it's holding on to something? Whereas, so, so when you reduce the hysteresis, this, the system is much more sensitive to its inputs. Whereas, so it's like the difference between self-excitation uh, versus being, uh, and when you reduce the self-excitation, only the external excitation can have an appreciable effect on the signal. Is, is that a fair way to think about it? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I sort of thought about it the inverse way, which is that as the gain of the system increased, now all of a sudden, the inputs which you were ignoring before become loud. And if they uh, are loud enough, then now all of a sudden you're kind of driven to distraction or, or maybe some positive ends by their inputs. Um, and you could also then imagine that going too far. So if I wanted to decide where to eat um, and I was in a foreign city, if I just went off on my own, maybe I'll find something that the chances are quite low. If I ask you know, a couple of people on the street, maybe they'll give me a good recommendation for a good place to eat. But if I asked everyone, that's going to start including, you know, homeless people and people that don't really want me to eat good food. And maybe I end up, you know, eating at a really crappy restaurant. So you can imagine this kind of balance between focusing on your own information, even if it's weak versus gathering a little bit of information. But if you gather too much and become influenced by too much of the, the global community, you can basically make non-adaptive decisions. So that's, that's the, the kind of high level concept. So that, that's really um, just, you know, just a, a glance at some of the things that we think neuroadrenaline can do. And I mentioned before that, um, that acetylcholine is, is another uh, really important chemical that, that ought to have, you know, quite different kinds of effects. So um, I'm not gonna compare it directly to neuroadrenaline just yet, just to give you a couple of the interesting features um, of this system. So in contrast to the, to the noradrenergic system, which really is dominated by this one little structure here, the locus cerullus, um, 
the, the cholinergic system has multiple different um, projection nuclei that are distributed in two main groups. So the one group just here in the brainstem is, is typically called the pedunc peduncular pontine tegmentum or the lateral dorsal tegmentum. And they have a lot of local projections. You can see to the thalamus, to the hypothalamus, to the basal forebrain. Um, and um, they also project down into the, um, into the spinal cord, into the cerebellum. And then, so this is the, we call this the brainstem subgroup. And then over here in an area called the basal forebrain, we have the forebrain subgroup. And there are, there are a few different uh, nuclei here. The main one that you'll hear about is called the basal nucleus of Maynard. And it basically is this uh, big structure that projects out to really the whole cerebral cortex, as well as into the, um, the, uh, the thalamus. And one, one interesting fact is that the peduncular pontine tegmentum projects to the, um, the, the excitatory cells in the, in the thalamus, whereas the basal forebrain projects to the excitatory cells uh, and the reticular nucleus, uh, which is inhibitory. Um, whoops, I should have drawn that link there. Um, so the basal nucleus of Maynard's one you'll hear about. Um, another one you'll hear about is called the medial septum. It projects into the hippocampus um, and innovates the hippocampus with acetylcholine. Um, and then there's other ones called the diagonal band of Broca and the vertical band of Broca. And another one, I, you gotta love the old names for these things, the substantia and nominata, um, uh, the substance we can't name. Um, it's just this little vertical sort of sliver of cholinergic cells. Um, one interesting thing, little factoid about um, cholinergic cells, which I think is kind of fascinating is that they actually aren't nuclear in the same way that adrenergic or dopaminergic cells or serotonergic cells might be. In fact, if you look under a microscope, they look like someone sort of spray painted onto a wall with every morsel of paint being a cell. And so there'll be certain parts that are very concentrated and have lots of cells and other parts that kind of tail off and sort of smear off into the, into the surrounding uh, area. So they really don't you know, belong in nuclei as, as, as much as some of the other cells that we would think about. So um, two main types of receptors as well. I didn't have a really good um, graph for this. Hold on, I've lost my... Um, two main types of receptors. There's uh, the nicotinic receptors, um, so the nicotinic receptors are those ionotropic ones that I was mentioning before, and they have a really fast time scale. Um, and then the muscarinic acetylcholinergic receptors, of which there are two main classes. So these are the M1-like and the M2-like receptor. And these guys here are the GI type, and these guys are the GQ type. And so you'll find them expressed all over the brain in lots of different places, presynaptic, postsynaptic, and they're going to have lots of different effects depending on their mechanism, mechanism of action. Um, one really famous um, uh, result that the, um, the cholinergic system is, is uh, related to has been um, popularized by Mike Hasselmo. Uh, and the idea is that um, the cholinergic tone can change the way that the hippocampus can function. Uh, and so <clears throat> the idea is that the cholinergic system has this kind of uh, approximately theta frequency oscillation. So for, you know, five, five to eight times a second, it's, it's having burst, uh, bursts of activity. And in different cycles of that oscillation, uh, the hippocampal network can basically be pushed into different configura configurations that promote either encoding at low cholinergic tone or retrieval at high cholinergic tone. So the idea would be that certain subsections, this is just a little diagram of, of the hippocampus. You can imagine some inputs coming in from the entorhinal cortex, let's say to CA3. Uh, it has recurrent connections and not drawn here as the dentate gyrus, the perforant pathway. And then you've got outputs from CA3 to CA1. It might be that certain of these uh, connections are, might, be, uh, might have expression of particular uh, muscarinic receptors, let's say M1 receptors, which then promote uh, the, the retrieval of a particular uh, encoded memory from the uh, architecture of CA3 and the dente gyrus. Um, whereas if acetylcholinergic levels are low, uh, now all of a sudden these pr uh, projections within the hippocampus are much weaker. And so you can encode information, let's say in the architecture of the um, of the CA3, but you, you're not very good about then having that um, memory imbue its, its activity or its influence on, on the uh, top-down influence on the internal cortex. Um, a really fascinating link to this. Um, uh, so uh, Clara Callahan uh, and Ishan Lopola are a couple of collaborators uh, of mine. We just recently um, uh, put, put out a paper where we were trying to link some of these ideas to the notion of mind wandering. Um, and the, the idea being that when you have low levels of acetylcholine, what you're essentially doing is you're promoting a, a, a circuit resonance such that you can get um, these really, really high frequency uh, ripple-like events. 
which are typically associated with an animal um, wandering around its environment, uh, let's say a novel environment, let's say a new maze. And the idea is that as soon as the animal gets to rest, now they have all these little ripple events. And if they then track the, uh, the ripple events uh, and they look at the activity patterns, it looks almost as if they're reinstantiating the kind of um, the path of navigation that they took on the previous trial or even trials beforehand. And now this becomes really important when the trials are rewarded versus punished, because what you'd really like to do is to say, go through the, um, the, uh, the path once, um, then come back and then reflect upon that, allow the system to basically use the information it just gained to make its uh, um, next action much more adaptive. And this notion is that, uh, the, the, we, we are proposing at least in this, in this paper, is that um, sharp wave ripples are essentially related to what we would call mind wandering in, in people, which is that when you have a bit of a downtime, you're not particularly focused on something, you're not particularly stressed, you got, you've got this ability to kind of go back through your memory and re-engage a particular event. Um, and the idea is that um, that uh, uh, system, the link between those is the neuromodulatory system. And so the idea is that at particularly uh, these ripple events, if you go look at the pharmacology, um, they really, really don't happen very often at all when acetylcholine or serotonin are high in the system. So you need to have those at a low level. Um, they do tend to happen um, quite a bit when dopamine's high, but you can block dopamine and it'll still happen. So it's not exclusively related to dopamine, but it's maybe augmented by it. And noradrenaline or norepinephrine is a sort of intermediate level. You don't want to be too, uh, have too much noradrenaline, but intermediate to low levels are important because if you have none, you're essentially um, you know, in a coma. And so the idea that there's this sort of link between this circuit that we were just looking at before, um, just drawn out now kind of on the background of a, of a hippocampus, um, you can imagine now that there's this little entorhinal cortex circuit here with its um, layer two, three cells in the supergranular layer and a layer five cell, in the, uh, cell body in the infragranular layer. Um, uh, the hippocampus doesn't care about um, X, Y, Z coordinates. It, it's sort of, it's like flipped on its head often and sort of twisted around. It's kind of like if someone put a cortex in one of those carnival rides where you have to like spin around in a teacup. And so this is kind of like upside down version of what we would typically see if we looked at a cerebral cortex, um, you know, with the superficial layers uh, at the top and the, the um, and then the deep layers at the bottom. Um, and the idea is that the supergranular layers of the entorhinal cortex project into different populations of these um, uh, hippocampal cells. And the one that I was showing you before with, with uh, my Castlemo's work is the CA3 population, uh, as well as this dentate gyrate population. Um, and this is actually where a lot of the magic occurs. These mossy fibers are extremely, um, uh, extremely plentiful. And the idea is that what that uh, input is doing is sort of like copying the input that it receives via the perforant pathway to give you this sort of extra high resolution copy of the input. So you can then use it to characterize the specific context that you were in and make a copy, let's say an, an episodic memory. Um, then the CA3 comes back out to CA1 and then influences the, the entorhinal cortex by driving the basal dendrites of the layer five primal neuron. So it turns out that there's a lot of these little interneurons sitting around uh, in um, uh, fast spiking basket cell interneurons sitting around in the, uh, in the hippocampus. And it turns out that they're exclusively um, the only cell within this uh, population of the hippocampus that express M2 receptors, which is a, um, uh, an inhibitory, a GI uh, receptor. And so the idea is that uh, we're working on a, a modeling project at the moment that basically tries to, try to, tries to understand if you inhibited these cells, uh, which might be uh, in, crucial for forming a sharp wave ripple that we talked about before with that, um, that encoding event, then maybe that still allows the system to um, oscillate in, in different frequencies, but doesn't allow that really, really sharp wave ripple. And so in other words, the, the settle calling can be that little control parameter for changing the kinds of emergence um, oscillations that you can get in this kind of a network that then have different kinds of um, cognitive sequelae. Um, uh, Max, another. So, oh yeah, so, sure. Uh, if I remember correctly, one of one of Hasselmo's justifications for the, um, separating the encoding and retrieval is that CA3 is a strongly auto-associative, uh, potentially auto an auto-associative network because it has all this excitatory uh, yeah. recurrent co connectivity. And I always forget which is which, but one of the one of the two modes of ACH can can tamp down on that. And does that does that also involve this? This this muscarinic receptor. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm definitely not an expert here, Johan. But um, in talking with, um, I had a chat with uh, Yuri Bujaki just recently. It was absolutely fascinating and fun um, to talk with him. And he basically has all this slice 
apparently there's a lot of slice evidence that to create the ripple event, you don't need any glutamatergic signaling. It's a, it, you, the ripple event can be supported purely with the GABAergic uh, interactions between pargabam and interneurons. So long as they get an excitatory kick, let's say from the perforant pathway or from the mossy fibers, they can start to basically oscillate at really, really high frequencies. And don't forget, these fast spiking interneurons are um, oscillating at rest, right? They're autonomous oscillating neurons. So that input is really going to change the phase of that neuron rather than whether it'll fire in a kind of traditional integrating fire um, mode. And so the idea here is that those cells, if they're expressing M2 receptors, are now um, no longer able to support that high frequency resonance, but rather can, uh, so, but can, they can still oscillate in different ways, just not in such a way that it maybe enslaves the system to act in a particular way, let's say gating the outputs of the CA3 cells. Um, now all of a sudden they can, they can do that, but at much slower, and maybe that gives time for that recurrent cir circuit in CA3 to act. And maybe that's what allows you to retrieve a memory rather than encode it. I, I'm definitely not an expert in this area, but it's, that, there's a really, it's a really fascinating space to kind of wander around in because the hippocampus is so well studied, right? There's tons of work that's been done on the hippocampus, the molecular characterization, the different receptor subtypes, et cetera, et cetera. And try to think about how that circuit could give rise to different emergent oscillatory phenomena, which then have different Cognitive secular, I think, is a super interesting problem, but I, I'm definitely not an expert on it. I just wanted to kind of draw people's attention to an, an area where neuromodulators can have a big, um, big effect on the circuit. Um, another paper that I really love, um, that I think people in this group would get a kick out of, um, is this 2013 plus one paper. And essentially, what the group was doing was trying to mimic the effect of the nucleus basalis of Maynard. Right, that was that little. Um, projection nuclei in the basal forebrain I told you about before that projects out to the cerebral cortex. And they tried to take some knowledge of some of the super granular layers um, activity here. So they don't have all the different cell types, but they've got uh, something which I imagine is a little bit like a somatostatin interneuron, even though they've used calretinin here as their marker. And then a fast spiking parvamin interneuron, which has a gap junction connection with other fast spiking parvamin interneurons. And then pyramidal neurons with both local connections and, and distant connections. And then they've got a, a, a top-down projection coming from layer five onto the apical dendrites of these pyramidal neurons. And um, what they were trying to do was basically try to map this idea of the addition of acetylcholine and the ways that we think it affects the circuit onto the notion of an attractor landscape. And so essentially what they did was they took this model and then they created this, um, this sort of attractor landscape where now you can imagine that there's a, a little population of uh, cortical neurons where the activity of that neuron uh, population determines its location on this on this little grid. And so if the neurons are spiking away in a particular um, fashion, that'll be as if they were sitting in this basin. And there's now an energy well, but in this case, it's quite, quite shallow, that's stopping them from going into this other configuration of the network, and then sort of wandering over to this configuration. So you can almost imagine this sort of little metastable state where it can kind of like flick around, kind of using stochastic noise to drive it between these different um, these different uh, states of the system. And essentially what they found was as they uh, increased the level of acetylcholine in, this, in their circuit, um, and this was due to the fact that they were augmenting those um, CR plus, uh, in, I'm thinking somatostatin interneurons, what they essentially were able to do was to create a situation where the energy barriers that were stopping the system, uh, that, were, that were basically beforehand providing very little in the way of, um, uh, uh, um, what's the word, very little way of a barrier to stop from pattern one to two to three. Now, all of a sudden it was, if you're in pattern three, you could not get out to pattern two or to pattern one. You're stuck in this basin of attraction um, because the system is basically locked down um, into that uh, particular configuration that you were stuck in at that time. Um, and the reason that I find this really, really interesting is that there's a, a strong literature linking the idea that acetylcholine is really important for focused attention um, in fact, uh, in this paper, um, Schmitz and Duncan go as far as to, to make the argument that uh, acetylcholine um, achieves this capacity through what they would call divisive normalization, which to me, at least to my um, sort of uh, weakly trained eyes, is, is very similar to this, this notion here, where if you're in a particular attractor, if you turn up the amount of normalization in the system, your ability to then have the solution be one of these other attractors um, is diminished. Um, and so th this is just a paper that I wanted to draw people's attention to where they, they kind of go into different interneuron um, subpopulations and they think about the effect of um, cholinergic neuromodulation on this kind of a circuit. 
and then make an argument that um, the system basically can kind of support this idea of divisive normalization, um, which, which could be one of the kind of explanations for why cholinergic tone is so important for focused attention. So we All right. really oh, yeah. think of CR as the disinhibitory neurons, although that the data is not a whole lot. But so it, it, is it that the ACH is, is uh, tamping down on the, wait, is tamping down on this, uh, oh wait, oh, is increasing the CR activity so that the, there's more recurrent excitation. Is, is, that, is that the idea? I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this. I read a, a paper um, just this morning, in fact, by, um, uh, by Magrinka Sir's group in Nathan Nero from a couple of years ago, um, Chen et al. And they are making an argument, um, this is in, um, in mice, that the somatostatin interneurons are the ones that respond the most to um, acetylcholine. And in doing so, they come in and uh, inhibit parvalbumin cells, let's say the fast spiking cells, which then would allow the parameter neuron to function in that particular window. But they're also going to inhibit VIP cells as well. So that's going to change the gating. But I think one of the things that is missing from that story is that VIP interneurons are, um, have a lot of nicotinic receptors on them. So imagine if I put in, um, let me see if I can draw. So let's say I've got a little nicotinic receptor here. Whoops. I thought I was drawing. I got my little nicotinic receptor here, right? And that's going to act really, really quickly. And I've got my little muscarinic receptor here, and that's going to act slowly. So if I put acetylcholine into the system, I'm now going to quickly cause this, this system to, um, to work, which is going to inhibit this structure, right? Which is then going to remove its inhibition over parvalbumin. So then now this can do its little gamma synchrony. But at a slower time scale, I'm now going to bring this guy on board, which is going to shut him up, and it's going to stop him from functioning. And now the, you can't have that emergent kind of ping gamma. This is a very speculative <laughs> way of me trying to like make sense of a of a, a paper I read this morning. So don't don't put any <laughs> credence on this whatsoever. Um, but you know, th it also reminds me of something you said, Johan, a few few weeks back, which is that anytime you get multiple inhibitory connections um, in a row, you've got to be a bit careful because your intuition can break down pretty quickly. Right, but the the reason I said that was the the way that we've been modeling CR. So so just for anyone who's not aware of all these weird letters, they're all calcium binding proteins that that uh, you can use to label different types of, of neurons, and they're not actually consistent across species particularly. Uh, so the the things that you can use to label uh, in, in interneurons in mice will not work perfectly in in rats, let alone monkeys, and even between humans and 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 uh, rhesus macaques is a huge is a big jump. So. In the end, you will have to actually use structural uh, descriptions. So, if which is why I asked whether the CR in that previous slide was um, dis primarily disinhibiting, because if I were modeling the effect that Mac just mentioned, the first thing I would do is is that, which is tamp down, oh, sorry, increase the disinhibition in order to increase self excitation. So, if yeah. there's a recurrent circuit, then uh, primary neurons exciting each other locally will uh, uh, be, be uh, in an attractive uh, an attractor state. It might even be runaway excitation if you have too, li too little inhibition from those PV cells or even the CB cells. So, so the CR is, a, if you just use that, which many people have argued that that's what CR is doing. And so uh, that's a nice sort of one, uh, one dimensional way to control the degree to which the system is uh, stuck in a loop. So that's it's not exactly the size of the basin, but it's the depth of the basin. Mm. Because the more local excitation you have, uh, the harder it is to bump the, the larger system out of that particular attractor uh, into a, an, a neighboring one. So, so, uh, so if it's what I said earlier about the CR, it works without too much hassle. But the more of these connections you throw in the, uh, among the internal neur neurons, the, the more complicated it gets. So, so, Mac, uh, you, you were kind of like sh uh, sh shuttling back between uh, somatostatin and uh, calritin. Uh, if I remember correctly, is it, uh, maybe I'm wrong, is it, isn't it the case that there, uh, the, it's the somatostatin uh, expressing interneurons are more common in rodents than in primates? Or am I talking about some other cities? Is it calvin and or one of those things. Johan, do you know the answer to this? I don't know that, that literature very I, well. I keep forgetting which is which, but I think that the somatostatin is, is a, in terms of the 
role it plays in, in most cortical areas. I think somatostatin is like the CB uh, neurons that, that we label in our lab, and they are primarily uh, inhibitors of the of the apical dendrite and the distal uh, tufts. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the VIP, I believe, is equivalent to the CR, uh, which is the primarily disinhibitory. But again, a caveat, just for, because I yeah. know it is, that this is true in upper layers. In deep layers, it's a bit more complicated. And those disinhibitory cells may be regular inhibitory cells in the deep layers. So whenever you read about these things, be careful because the knowledge of the deep layers and inhibition is less. So, uh, and PV, I think, is, is the safe one to assume. It's uh, somatic yeah, and the blast cells, initial yeah. segment. It, it just, you know, shuts, it's a blast of inhibition. It shuts down the firing. Or or yeah. or causes or damage. ping, okay, yeah, yeah. Mac, uh, thanks, I, uh, I'm going to like uh, like force you here a bit because you made the case that the uh, the acetylcholine is uh, forcing the divisive uh, normalization here. Mm. Uh, why do we have to suppose it has to be the acetylcholine at all, right? Like it can uh, very well occur if uh, even without any sort of uh, uh, cholinergic bump in the state. If I were to assume that is a recurrent set of connectivity where there is positive uh, feedback of some sort, uh, mm -hmm. I, I am mostly guaranteed I can always uh, string up a, a network that can kind of achieve this sort of divisive normalization. What, what would be the special role that ACH is playing in that sort of a divisive normalization that you're talking about that can be achieved? Like I'm asking like- Yeah, no, 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 I, it's a great question, Kartik. And I think um, I think that's actually like sort of where the rubber hits the road is that I think, um, a nervous system without a, um, a neuromodulatory system is going to be a way, way less adaptive and way less um, uh, effective nervous system. So I, I think you could do an awful lot of these things with neurons in a dish. Um, you could put them into a very artificial um, circumstance. You could get them to, you know, do divisive normalization if you had just the right slice or whatever. But if you put neuromodulators in there in the appropriate context, in the appropriate concentrations, I think it augments the, um, the different kinds of outputs from that system in such a way that they can then be used for adaptive behavior. So if we go back to the stomatic gastric ganglion, if it gets too hot, you don't want to be bloody digesting your food. You get the hell out of there, right? So temperature becomes this extremely important you know, rule for how the system should function. Whereas if you're sitting around and there's plenty of, you know, um, neuromodulatory chemicals associated with the parasympathetic nervous system, now's a great time for you to process your food. There's nothing really stressful going on. You don't smell any predators. You know, there's no one you're trying to mate or anything like that. You're not trying to go to sleep. You just like go for that digestion because that's the good time. So in other words, I, I, I would argue that the kind of the neuromodulatory system is essentially augmenting existing features of the nervous system in such a way that it provides context specificity and adaptive behavior. Can I um, offer a synthesis between what Kartik said and what yeah. you said? So you can, like, I think what he what he was saying was that you can get uh, that type of uh, control over the tractor size and basin locally using just thalamic input, cortical cortical input. But what you won't get is precisely what you talked about in the first twenty minutes or so, which is this global kind of effect. So mm -hmm. if you have systems that are integrating overall state of the brain of the body of anything, then you you have this ability to change the mode of everything. So simultaneously, which is not going to be the, uh, uh, the case with uh, changing the attractor uh, basins or other parameters locally. So, uh, and why, they, why I link this to the binding idea is that many things are happening in different parts uh, of, the, of yeah. the brain. And if they start to drift out of phase, these types of, of resets or, or events that are global uh, give everything a, a chance to, as you said, re kind of align. Oh, and in your model, actually, that's precisely what it does, right? So, mm. so, uh, so it's not that you don't. That's not that you need ACH if you're looking at a local circuit, but it's it's for the value addition of having a fairly low dimensional signal go everywhere. Is how I would assume. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really great summary. Um, so, with that in mind, and with me noticing that I've been talking for eighty minutes and I still have half of my slides left. <laughs> um, would it be, maybe Johan, you can, you, you can, I can ask a ju jury of one. Would it be more fun for me to quickly cover dopamine and serotonin and then talk about the kind of different interesting interactions between these things or to stop and have a discussion? I I'm happy to kind of- My request ahead, but... is that you do serotonin first. Oh, let's do <laughs> if, it. If you feel like. <laughs>
No, I love it. Okay, serotonin. So this is a, an area of um, evolving um, re reduction in ignorance for me. I'm still extremely ignorant of a lot of the complexities of serotonin. Um, so the main, serotonin is quite fascinating um, if you look at its, um, its, its architecture. So it's not very accurately described here. There's actually like this sort of set of cells that kind of run up and down like a bunch of little toothpicks that were someone shoved into the brainstem uh, on either side of the um, of the of the aqueduct, right? So here, if I just color these things in, so here's the um, the fourth ventricle here, leading up into the um, third ventricle, and then the lateral ventricles, right, that make those big horns that run around here, full of CSF, and the ventricular system is actually like hugging them, like right next to them. And there's lots of different raphes, so they're called the raphe nuclei. And Brandon uh, in my lab recently looked up the etymology of this, and it turns out that um, the the term comes from the, the word seam. So it's like a seam running up and down the brainstem. And so there's the raphe magnus, the um, the, the median raphe, the dorsal raphe, lots and lots of different raphes. Um, the one you hear about a lot in terms of um, the central nervous system is the dorsal raphe. Um, and it projects in a way that's very similar to the noradrenergic system in that it basically projects out really kind of diffusely and has axons that project to multiple different regions in the same, um, from the same axon. Uh, I didn't mention this properly before, but the cholinergic system does something quite, quite different. The basal nucleus will project to here, let's say, and there, but it will definitely not project here and here. So it has very precise topological projections whereas the raphe and the noradrenergic system have much more diffuse projections. Um, typically when you hear about serotonin, um, you hear about it in the context of um, the drug companies that made the most money off the concept, uh, these ser selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, and I actually had this, this is quite a bit of an aside, but it was kind of fun to think about. Um, I was writing a grant proposal a few years ago, um, thinking about noradrenaline and trying to argue for why um, it really wasn't as well studied as serotonin. And if you look back at the, um, I did a PubMed search and I basically looked back at the number of publications over the years that, um, so here's number of publications on the, on the Y axis and then the years on the, on the X. And if we plot, if you plot the um, number of publications talking about serotonin and the number of population, uh, publications talking about noradrenaline or, nep or norepinephrine, because we know people don't, um, uh, use these terms necessarily interchangeably. Um, so they were both basically on the up and up. They were both, you know, mid nineties, they were both killing it. They were like uh, vanilla ice, uh, just absolutely smashing the 1990s. And then right around 1995, 96, something really interesting happened. This happened to serotonin and this happened to noradrenaline. And um, you won't, I've already kind of ruined the surprise here. This was right when, um, the SSRIs were um, popularized by Pfizer and people started saying that serotonin was the cause of all of the mental health disorders in the world. And all you need to do is just propagate the amount of serotonin at a synapse and you'd somehow solve, you know, depression and anxiety and schizophrenia and, you know, um, PTSD and every, every uh, possible thing that you could imagine was salt was caused by um, a lack of serotonin. Um, for, for whatever reason, rather than that, like really increasing our understanding of the system. I think it's probably obfuscated things quite a bit because there's quite a bit of sort of um, uh, confusion in the literature, I would, I would argue still about, you know, what these guys are doing. Um, uh, in this case for SSRIs, really what they do is they block the reuptake. So the idea would be that if there's a little serotonin um, uh, uh, axon that releases serotonin at a synapse, what the system would like to do is to use that serotonin. It's costly to turn serotonin or to create serotonin from, um, from food, from phenylalanine, right? You take, you eat food that has lots of phenylalanine in it, often turkeys, the kind of example people use, but it's in lots of lots of different foods, a few different conversions, and then you get serotonin. Well, you don't want to have to do that again and again and again, that's costly. So what you'd like to do is take the serotonin you've released that's done its job at the receptor site and then recycle it back into the, um, into the terminal and then put it back into a little uh, vesicle for later use. And what SSRIs do is they block this reuptake such that serotonin gets potentiated at the synapse. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of the effects that happen clinically from SSRIs actually happen uh, less acutely than you might imagine. They take a few weeks to, um, to occur. And so one of the kind of toy ideas is that 
Maybe it's the fact that you've potentiated, potentiated um, serotonin at the synapse and then the sort of downstream um, regulatory kinds of processes that happen when the system recognizes that there's lots of serotonin around that are the, uh, the cause of some of the benefits that have occurred from SSRIs, which if we're gonna um, uh, you know, uh, get into this stuff are probably not as overwhelming as you would have hoped given how much Pfizer um, tried to convince people back in the 90s that was the case. Um, so the, the, the functional significance of serotonin is, is really challenging to, um, to pull apart. And I don't pretend to be an expert in this um, in, in any way, shape or form, but one way of thinking about this that I've really enjoyed is reading um, Kenji Doya's work. So he's at the University of Okinawa and Kenji's uh, hypothesis is that serotonin is essentially signaling the, um, the, this sort of what he calls a temporal discounting um, feature. And so the idea is that every action that you undertake um, in your you know, moment to moment life is somehow trading off the future from the present. It's trying to work out is what I'm doing right now the most effective way for me to exploit the current resources or to explore for more resources or to get the hell out of there because the, the future or the current is really risky and I need to put it off to the future. And so he's done a bunch of experiments that I, I don't have the expertise or the, or the time to really unpack properly. But if you're interested in serotonin, I 100% recommend reading some of his work. The idea is something like on the right here, the little marshmallow test, right? The idea that if you've got the ability to believe that the future is stable enough that you will get the reward that you want now, if you just wait, then the serotonin system is extremely important for, for doing that. Um, now, how does that work? Um, that's a whole other question. I have a little toy theory that I think is kind of fun to think about that puts things in the context of the systems architecture I talked about um, a couple months ago. Um, it turns out that um, serotonin receptors are really, really heavily expressed in a very particular group of cells in the cerebellum. And these are called Lugaro cells. Uh, Lugaro cells are essentially like the VIP or the calretinin neurons that you were mentioning before, uh, Johan, that are a disinhibitory type of receptor. So the idea is that these Lugaro cells are sitting um, in amongst all of these weeds here of these other interneurons and inhibiting them. Whoops. So, so let, me, let me walk through this just to remind people of the cerebellum. So we have um, a set, we've got um, a set of inputs here coming from the pontine nuclei. So the pontine nuclei are that big bulge that you see on, um, on, on, the, on the brainstem here. So they receive layer five inputs, come down to the pontine nuclei, come in here to the mossy fibers, and then they come up and they hit this population of granule cells, which are the most numerous uh, cell in the entire body, some uh, entire brain, sorry. Um, something like 50% uh, uh, of your sort of cells in your brain are supposed to be these little granule cells in your cerebellum, in the cerebellar cortex. Um, these guys project up these parallel fibers, which are then contacted by these really, really odd uh, Purkinje fibers. They're odd because they exist in two dimensions. They're like uh, in that movie Inside Out, where they kind of walk into that deconstruction zone and they become two-dimensional cartoons. They, they basically have, they live on this plane where they listen in to these um, parallel fibers, almost like doing a wiretap on the, on the messages that are conducted by the granule cells. And a lot of plasticity occurs here, often long-term de depression, but also long-term potentiation. And then these Purkinje cells then project back down to the deep cerebellar nuclei, which are the only output of the cerebellum, which then come back to the core thalamic nuclei, as well as the red nucleus and other structures in the brainstem, uh, which then back via, um, uh, via the thalamus then come back to the cerebral cortex and complete this really complicated loop. So I've argued before to you guys that this, this system is really, really well set up for parallel processing, but you've got to know when to use it. So if we've got all these little interneurons here, which are basically inhibiting some dendrites here or in inhibiting a cell body here. Maybe they're over here in inhibiting the, the apical dendrites of a pyramidal neuron. What you'd really like over the top of all of that is a bunch of you know, higher level managers that could tell those interneurons when it was time to be quiet and when it was time to, um, to, to listen. And um, it turns out that um, these little receptors here, th these little cells, these Lugaro cells, are actually, uh, you can read about in, the, in this, this paper here, are actually chock full of 5-HT3 receptors, which are an ionotropic receptor. 
So that means that if, if you get a burst of, of um, serotonin into the cerebellum, that's basically going to disinhibit the whole circuitry of the cerebellum. It's going to allow the granule cells to process more, the, cere- the Purkinje cells to, to get, get on with the job, to, um, to gate the, the deep cerebellar nuclei and have an influence on ongoing behavior. So in other words, it, <clears throat> you can think of serotonin as giving a boost to the cerebellar architecture. So then the question becomes, well, what's happening out here in the cerebral cortex? And if you go back to that, study that I was talking to you about before from Zillis and Palomero Gallagher's group, right? Where we did the nanometer reconstruction of the brain and then did all these little probes to work out where the receptors are. Um, Look at all these 5-HT1A receptors across the cortical mantle. So from uh, sensory granular regions in V1 all the way out to um, area 24, which I know is one that you care about, Johan. And in each case, um, these 5-HT1A receptors which um, I'll be testing your memory here, but whoops. These 5-HT1A uh, receptors are of the GI type, right? So if you have a um, firing rate curve here, um, let's see, something like this. So now, now the amount of input and how much it gets translated into output. If I go in and put um, uh, serotonin into each of these little areas here, where all the apical dendrites are layer two, three pyramidal cells and layer five pyramidal cells are sitting, that's going to have the effect of shifting my curve and flattening it, all right? So now I need way more input to get the same output that I would have gotten before. Um, right here, I only need this much input, right? So I'm, in a way, I'm dampening the system in terms of the feedback projections that are coming in. So if we then put that all together, this is just a hypothesis. There's no, uh, you know, the evidence for this is, is still kind of, you know, to be determined. What we're essentially, you know, able to do with this serotonin chemical, right, is we can take this little signal here, whoops, we can take this little signal here down in the RAFE that's listening into whether or not now's a safe time or not. And if it's safe, we can say, hey, cerebellum, go off and do all the parallel processing you're doing. Now's a good time to drive home and listen to your favorite podcast and, you know, um, steer along, everything's just fine. Um, And what I want you to do there as well is I want you to shut up the cortex, the feedback, so that whatever comes back out via the um, the cerebellum via these, these, deep, um, these core nuclei is gonna then drive the cortex in a feed forward mode. It's gonna let you basically take care of what's going on rather autonomously. Um, if all of a sudden someone swerves across your path, now all of a sudden the serotonin level is gonna drop. Sorry, I'm losing track of my controller here. The serotonin level is gonna drop um, because now the, the, the current state of the system is not safe. And that's gonna let the current context of the system basically take over. And, you know, don't forget our little friend, uh, Lucas Cirillus, whoops, sitting right next to the dorsal raffae right here, which is gonna give you that big boost in gain across the system and give you that network reset so that now you can swerve away and not do the thing you were doing before, which is absentmindedly driving home. So uh, it's admittedly a toy kind of description with a lot of hand-waving and not a lot of, um, of evidence for it yet. But I think the idea is very plausible that you need your neuromodulatory system, not just to tell you that you should be looking at this or that, but that now is a good time in order to do it in this way or some other way. So uh, Matt, uh, just yeah. to, add to, a, to a sort of like a cognitive concept, uh, what you're saying with respect to serotonin can be kind of, uh, and the, the temporal discounting idea that, uh, that you just uh, drew with the, the sigmoid, like you know, changing its, uh, its shape. Uh, could we just then say that um, it's sort of the the global contextual version of an inhibition on return or something like that? Is that uh, is that the right way to like? I mean, just better. Sorry, I, I I missed the last part. Global inhibition on what? Uh, like it, it's the, the 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 fact that you talk, showed that uh, sigmoid changing, right? Like from yeah. uh, with uh, the amount of output produced is going to decrease. Uh, and, uh, and requires actually more input to drive it to have yeah. more. So it's a we, burst fire, yeah. Yeah, could we think of then this sort of uh, serotonin, uh, like just like you described the ACH as a divisive normalization thing at the at the global level that Johan kind of synthesized. Uh, yeah. Can we also say then that the serotonin is kind of uh, doing the equivalent of a global version of an inhibition on return uh, or avoiding an inhibition on return so that you continue um, in some sort of an autopilot mode while you're driving the car so that you don't really, uh, you know. Like, yeah, no, I like that idea. Yeah, no, that's neat. I, I don't know enough about IOR to, to comment enough about that mechanism and like the links there, but I definitely think yeah. that 
Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. We, we can flesh that out a little bit. So the, when I think Max said feedback and feed forward, but in this, we haven't mentioned that the uh, projections from higher order cortices to lower typically typically go from deep layers to superficial layers. So if these 5-HT1A receptors are so uh, biased towards the upper layers, then, uh, and if the effect is what I understood it to be as a, as kind of a threshold shift effectively, then what you're doing, if we understand feedback in the anatomical sense to also mean feedback in the sense of top-down expectation prior, yeah. whatever you want to call it, then what we're saying is that uh, top-down feedback needs to be much stronger in order to cross that barrier. So it's, an, 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 and conversely, you're sort of uh, making bottom-up mode less constrained by the top-down, mm -hmm. uh, which if you want, we can bookmark for a conversation about, you know what, uh, after I turn off the uh, <laughs> recordings. Uh, but, uh, but it's a very interesting uh, way to think about what that does. And I was thinking about this, remember Paul Chisek said that 5-HT, if you look at the uh, evolution of it, seems to be related to satiety. Mm. And so now I was thinking, what kind of- It's like Paul so rich in the gut. It's like yeah, all through yeah. the so, gut. It's like, so, yeah, yeah. So, so okay, this is very speculative, right? But if it's the case that satiety does in fact cause a boost in, in 5-HT, even in the brain, and let, let's generalize satiety to not just mean eating, maybe other things as well, then, uh, it's sort of like, you know, after you've had a meal, you're, you don't have that much to do and you, you're kind of like in a state of calm. It would be interesting to think of this disengagement of top-down uh, expectations in those terms. It's, it's very, very specula speculative, but it's consistent. I love with that. You've told us so far, right? Is it, isn't yeah. it? Like, well, I, I, think, and I think it even goes one further, Johan, because if you then look at the other major class of receptors in the serotonergic system, which anyone who... Uh, has read, you know, there's a lot of recent work on this, the 5-HT2A receptors, is that the analogy then would be taking um, entheogens would be like increasing your cognitive appetite, right? Instead of being, um, you know, satisfied with the current way you have of dealing with the problem, you now need to search out many different ways of dealing with that problem. It's like, it opens up new solutions to the, to the problem that flattens the attractor landscape. So the idea, and if you look at the expression of these, cell, um, these receptors, they are all over pyramidal neurons, the layer five pyramidal neurons um, in the cerebral cortex. They're not exclusively there, but they, um, the 5-HT2A is right, are a GQ mechanism. So they're gonna basically liberate calcium. Ah, they're gonna liberate calcium um, in the cell. So basically they're gonna increase the excitability of, of, the, of these pyramidal neuron populations. And so if we then port that back into this idea that we were just talking about with the, um, the cerebellum, imagine now, if I've got intermediate levels of serotonin, because I didn't mention before, but 5-HT1A receptors are high affinity, which means they don't need very much serotonin to basically all, um, to get them, uh, uh, to excite them. Whereas 5-HT2A receptors are low affinity. You need much higher concentrations of noradrenaline, uh, of a serotonin to, to activate them. So now at, what we have now is this kind of, oh man, I keep forgetting to push the little draw button. I'm sorry. Um, where are we? Okay. Yeah, we're going to have like a little inverted U, right? Where here is cognitive satiation, and uh, this is now um, cognitive hunger. So this is uh, the system basically saying, um, how much should I basically trust the system and know that now is the right time to just take advantage of what I've done before? I've driven a thousand times on this road. Now's the time that I can just trust the system because I'm satiated that the cognitive issues are no longer a problem. Um, whereas now I know I need to go and find more information. I need to basically say every time that I've seen that stimulus before, I've used this subset of pyramidal neurons to deal with it. Well, guess what? Now we're in a different world, right? Now you're super excited. And so now, you know, Fred over here can give you an opinion and the homeless guy on the corner can give you an opinion. And all of a sudden you can see things in really weird ways. And so if we then map that to like something a little bit more tangible, um, a visual input that you normally see uh, without lots of 5-HT2 agonism is just a normal visual input. But now if I, and so like, let's say that's like propagating through some visual hierarchy. And now if I increase the excitability of your 5-HT2A system, now all of a sudden solutions to that problem, feed forward sweeps get ignored. And now you start going, well, what if it was tessellated across the space? Or what if that wasn't, uh, uh, was smeared across time? And then you can get those really fascinating things like palinopsias, um, which is where you see tails of images over time. 
or you know those interesting like grid-like hallucinations that people can get on on entheogens where if they look at um a carpet and then they look up at a wall the wall has the features of the carpet still embedded on it and so in other words you've like lost this ability to perceive your world because you've gone out to try to find a new solution to the, the particular set of inputs i, I find that uh, it's a fascinating idea so Max, really this is cool. how this is, so Max, this is how Pfizer has actually made all that money. They've actually increased yeah. their cognitive function. Exa so. Exactly. They just do it in a way that doesn't cause you to hallucinate. <laughs> <laughs> they've tickled they've tickled the five HT two A system, causing the system to reconfigure. Yeah. Is there lamina specificity for two A also? Uh, it's less well defined, and I think it changes more across the hierarchy. But with that, I could um, I could dig that paper out, and we could have a look and see if there's anything that would be kind of that would jump out. I mean, the, the 5-HT1A is is striking compared to the other um, the other kind of neurotransmitter populations. Um, uh, sorry, I need just, to, um, oh, oh, it's okay. Um, yeah, sorry, in, on this curve you just erased. Uh, oh, this, uh, hold on, watch uh, this, I mean, magic. Exactly, cool. <laughs> uh, so that, like, I didn't quite get, so you get this cognitive hunger on the right when you have excess of serotonin. Right. Uh, or... So this this would this would be all, so think about this as increasing concentration of serotonin, right? Five HT, mm -hmm. and if you've got a low level, no receptors are getting activated. If you've got a low to intermediate level, only the five HT one A's are going to get activated because they're the really high affinity receptors, and five HT three as well. And then when you get really, you need really high levels of serotonin, uh, high concentrations in order to activate two A's, and then in theogens, right? So like um, DMT, psilocybin, mm -hmm. LSD are exclusively uh, agonists for this receptor. So in other words, they're not like an endogenous ligand. They don't affect 1As at all, really. They, go, they come in and they zero in on this guy and they just turn up the volume on, his, on, on the effect of 2A. So it's sort of like going in and really pharmacologically tweaking a very particular receptor without having all of the other noisy biological effects you'd get if you had an endogenous ligand. Um, so yeah, you, I mean, so yeah, does that help explain it? Yeah, um, yeah. I guess my question was rather about like if this uh, peak of the curve with the one A receptor is activated corresponds to the like as you said the state of the like so, uh, how to say yeah safe situation where you can do things on autopilot and the uh, uh, very high serotonin the way as well activated corresponds to the situation with the um, yeah uncertainty and like yeah unsafe situation where you have to be alert or something like this, if I get it correctly, then what does yeah. the leftmost cor situation correspond to? Well, this, this would be like uh, non-conscious, you know, asleep um, in oh, a coma okay. or something like that. Right. So one thing I, I, I probably should have made more explicit at the start is that um, if you look at, um, yeah, if you look at the concentrations of the different neurochemicals in um, non-REM sleep, so like dreamless sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, and then awake, um, then typically what you find for the different um, groups, so noradrenaline is very low during non-REM sleep, is very low during REM, and then is high, and then has like a, a variation around it where you can have a low state and a high state, but it's, re it's re relative to the new mean, let's say. That's what I was talking about with the curve before. Um, Serotonin is very similar. So non-REM, REM and awake, very similar. Um, and then acetylcholine is actually kind of fascinating. Um, it does this. So your dreaming state is actually a purely cholinergic state where there's no monoamines around. Dopamine is kind of a, um, remember how I said before the dopamine was too cool for school? Well, it's the same thing here. It kind of like, is around a bit and then it's high in the wake, but it's like, it never goes away, right? It's too cool. It thinks it's like awesome and needs to be there for everything. My guess is that it's because it's a little bit more phylogenetically recent. That it doesn't have the same constraints as the other systems, but this, this idea of REM and, and awake is extremely highly conserved. Um, so yeah, what you'd imagine is that during non-REM or REM or dreamless sleep or in a coma, you're down over here in this stage, you wake up, you get to this intermediate point, which starts to tweak this, and as you start to deal with the challenges of the day, the particular goals that you have, particular uncertainty you have for like dealing with the problem, or in some people's cases, the heroic dose of LSD you took before you went for a walk in the woods, 
you start to augment this system such that it, the balance of the tone is shifted in different ways. So you could imagine like you have a crappy day, right? Like everything's going wrong. Um, you've tried, you know, um, running your MATLAB code again and again and again. You keep getting errors. You don't know where the error comes from. In a way, that's like shifting you up this curve. It's saying you can't run on autopilot, right? You need to start going around with your cognitive hunger and solving the problem that's at hand. Um, and if you start to do things well, you can shift back down the curve. So you don't drive, or, you know, um, mindlessly home in a, you know, a factor five hurricane um, with the radio blaring and, you know, your loved one on the phone yelling at you because you forgot to take out the, the, the garbage, right? You do, you drive home automatically when it's clean and dry outside, you're in a car that you've driven lots of times before, you're on a route you've driven before, and, you know, it's a, it's a nice time of day and you're feeling, you know, well fed and everything like that. So I think there's, it's important to think about these things as, as I think of them really as like little toggle switches that can help to shift this, the mode of the system such that you're acting in the most adaptive way given your current goal state. Yeah, okay. That, that answers your question. Sorry. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, um, Mac, uh, yeah. really quick. Um, uh, do you talk about this difference uh, between the different neuromodulators and their expression during, let's say, REM and awake in your paper? Or do you have like a good reference where I can look further into this? Yeah, sure. So um, it's one of those weird one, weird results that is so ubiquitous that you've got to go back to like 60s and 70s neuroscience to find people kind of showing it because after that, it's just sort of a given. So Maseya Steriard, um, Dave McCormick have got really great, you know, kind of papers on this back in the day. And then everything that since then is really just, um, you know, some reviews. So Cliff Saper, Emery Brown would be two that I would strongly recommend reading. And they've got a couple of, you know, like annual review neuroscience style, the effect of neuromodulators on arousal states in the brain kind of papers that, that talk about that. Um, my favorite, um, my favorite one, I don't know if I have a slide for. Um, yeah, I don't. I, um, we, we think a little bit about pupil dilation as this kind of indirect readout of the neuromodulatory system. And um, there's this kind of, um, I would say a bit of confusion in the literature because people will measure the pupil and then they'll go and measure things like cholinergic and adrenergic tone in the brain. Um, and they'll find that there's a sort of weak positive correlation with acetylcholine and a strong positive correlation with noradrenaline. And so they say, well, it would be great if this was just noradrenaline, but it looks like it's both. Um, but if you go down and like look at the pupil, um, the, the pupil has two main muscles that, that um, cause constriction or dilation. Um, the iris dilator muscle has a noradrenergic mechanism, which comes via an area called the superior cervical ganglion, which has an indirect relationship with the locus cerulis. And the cholinergic system actually inhibits it, it has the iris sphincter muscle by the, uh, by the ciliary ganglion, which has a connection with a cholinergic region called the edinger westphal nucleus. And um, what, what that means is that if I put acetylcholine into your eye, your pupil constricts. And anyone who's ever had an eye exam knows this because the drugs they use to make your eye dilate are atropine and scopolamine, which are cholinergic antagonists. So they block this, which means that the only thing left is the locus cerulis, which means your pupil dilates, right? Um, so the problem is that what we'd right, really like to do is use something like this feature down here uh, that we know REM is a cholinergic state and wake is this weird combination of, of balance. Because you can imagine like when you're awake and the pupil dilates, maybe noradrenaline's high and acetylcholine's high and they're both high. And so it's really hard to dissociate them. And this, but the problem is that when you're in REM and you're dreaming, your eyes are closed. So now we can't measure your pupil, right? We can't see what it's doing while you're asleep. And if we try to like open your eyes up forcibly, it's probably gonna kick you out of a dream, probably gonna wake you up and we're gonna have a big problem. Um, what this group did in mice was that they, um, they basically came up with, they have an infrared camera that sits on the inside the animal's skull and back projects onto the back of their eye. And then now if they look at the shadow on the outside of their eye, they can actually see whether the pupil is constricted or dilated based on the shadow of the infrared camera. And lo and behold, during the REM state, you get a pin pinpoint pupil that looks like someone's coming down off heroin. Um, absolutely tight pinpoint pupil. So um, there are, that's my favorite example of like the direct evidence of that system, you know, in an empirical paper recently, but most of them are really old. Mm -hmm. um, I can dig some up if you can, if you can, just send me an email. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Okay, awesome. Um, so it's almost been two hours and I, I still have more slides, but maybe um, I'll show you one more and then we can um, decide if we want to meet up another day and chat about it. Um, just to reinforce the serotonin angle for you, Johan. Um, a bunch of studies now, this is my favorite one. Enzo Tagliazucci in, um, in South America did a reanalysis of some of the group at UCL's data, which I think was really, really beautiful and sophisticated. Um, looking at the effect of psilocybin, which is an, a 5-HT2A agonist on um, brain network uh, activity. So if we go all the way back to that first thing where I was showing you the static network of the brain, and we were thinking about how could we reconfigure it? And we just had this big, long winding discussion about microcircuit properties and how they can change the excitability of the system, the receptivity of the system in ways that might be functional. Well, it turns out if you go and um, take a dose of psilocybin and augment those 5-HT2A receptors, you really increase the global coupling of the system. And I think that's really nice kind of evidence for this idea of the sort of hyper excitability. Um, I'm going to call this Johan's rule of, of uh, um, co uh, cognitive um, hunger that the system is, is in trying to find a new fit for the particular set of inputs in the context they're in. Um, so with that in mind, I've got other things that I could talk about, but um, it's almost been two hours. So I think maybe um, what I'll do is show you this little slide that we made um, of the, the stuff I talked to you about a couple months ago, which is right, this, this idea that if we look at the, um, if we look at the thalamus centric view of the brain, and we think about the basal ganglia affecting the matrix thalamus cells, and we think about the cerebellum as coordinating the core thalamic cells in the ventral tier, we can start to go through and draw out parts of this circuit and think about what these different neuromodulators could do. And so I'll take the example of serotonin because we just talked about it. The Ligaro cells are gonna increase the gain of the cerebellar system. It also turns out that the Ponte nuclei have got a whole bunch of these cells, uh, receptors as to the inferior olive, whereas the feedback, feed, pro feed um, processing in the cortex will be diminished. And I didn't speak about it, but um, serotonin actually hyperpolarizes relay cells in the thalamus. Um, and so really this whole kind of extended system in the telencephalon and diencephalon isn't really gonna like serotonin very much, uh, at least 5-HT1As, but the cere cerebellum does. And so you can think about these um, neuromodulators as kind of controlling the gain of the system in this really distributed sense, such that we can fulfill different um, co you know, cognitive functions. Um, so that, um, I thought that was an appropriate gift because I've been talking for way too long and I even like left out a lot. Um, you can tell that I really like neuromodulation. Um, I like to think about it a lot, uh, but it's still such a young space. So there's so much to do. We need more models. We need more nuance. We need more empirical results to kind of constrain things. Um, yeah. That, that was Thanks, really that great. Was fantastic. I, yeah, so. I, I had a one question about the relationships between these neuromodulators. You talked mm. wonderfully about each neuromodulator's effect, but how does say norepinephrine impact acetylcholine or vice versa? What's the, yeah. are there like- It's a great question. And, um, I yes. mean, their, their connectivity doesn't show any direct connections, right? So it's not like one obviously affects the other, but some third, what is ever is influencing them would influence them differentially. Yeah. Yes. So um, the answer, like all things in biology is extremely complicated and, and, um, and kind of nuanced. There are definitely structures that can influence all of them and kind of like almost set the tone for the tone setting system in a way. So um, the lateral hypothalamus and the medial hypothalamus are like a great example of a good place to look for those kinds of signals. So for example, Clifford Sape has done a lot of work showing that the trigger for moving from a, a sleep to a wake state is this orexinergic signal. Orexin is this chemical in the hypothalamus that then sort of spreads out and innovates all these different other structures and then kicks them across some bifurcation, closes a calcium channel, opens a calcium channel, which now means that they can start to spike. And then their spiking then closes a channel in the thalamus and then the whole thing kind of kicks on and you're awake. And then when enough sleep debt is, is picked up and enough circle, circuits start to sort of impinge like adenosine receptors are a great example, the system then flicks back and stops pumping erection into the system. And so you have these like flip-flop switches that are kind of controlling much of that architecture. Um, so that's one class of, of effects. Another class of effects is that um, a lot of these different um, uh, these, these different systems have projections to one another that are not bidirectional. So for example, the locus cerullus projects to the basal nucleus of Maynard, but not vice versa. Um, 
and we also, uh, but it's not consistent across the whole space. So the projections of the locus realis to the basal nucleus are excitatory, but they are inhibitory to somewhere like the edinger westphal which controls pupil constriction. So you get these really, really weird effects where some systems are boosted and some are diminished. Um, and then a third fa factor is that a lot of these systems have receptors on them that can keep them in check. So for example, the locus realis actually stains very heavily for acetylcholine esterase, um, right? It's one of the ways that they d d distinguish it in slice. Um, so it's got a cholinergic marker on it because it's receiving cholinergic inputs from somewhere and it has to respond to those. And trying to think about how all those things balance together is a very big, complicated problem. Uh, but there's tons and tons of checks and balances, I'd say, in the nervous system for exactly that problem. And I think if we start to think about these things in concert, that's when we're going to really make progress, right? Because it's never the case that dopamine gets squirted into the system on a flat landscape and then it has the effect of kicking in the reward prediction error or something like that. It's not like that, right? You're an animal in a body, in a space that has a certain familiarity and you've got a certain set of goals that are very salient or not to you. Like, you know, I'm hungry now. I haven't had lunch yet. I'm, you know, starting to think about food. So that food thing is itching away at me. And so if you give me dopamine now versus you give it to me at the start of the talk, different circuits are going to get impacted. And so I think we really need to be thinking about the context of the whole animal and its environment and its history to really make sense of these things. But when we do, I think we're going to find a lot of really cool stuff. So building on that idea, something I've, I've mentioned before. Oh, wait, Bryce, did you want to say something? Why don't, why don't you go first? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's in the same general vicinity, but um, what I was wondering about is if you have thoughts about how the regulatory hormones of various sorts are interacting with these kinds of structures, um, especially like vasopressin and oxytocin and CRH, yeah. which are going to play really important roles in regulating yeah. how some of these flows are going. It's an awesome question and nice to finally, I guess, virtually meet you. I've met you on Twitter before. Um, uh, yeah, great question. And something that I haven't, I haven't ripped that bandaid off just yet. Um, a lot of people at the Institute that I uh, am based at in Sydney, think a lot about oxytocin and its benefits for mental health, um, treatment or diagnosis of different mental health disorders. And I think that there'll be a lot of really fascinating links there. Um, I, I haven't had the time to really dig into those, but it's very hard to imagine a scenario where those kinds of low dimensional kind of signals for satiety, safety, comfort, in group, out group, all those different things are gonna have a huge effect on the kinds of cognitive operations that you conduct in those contexts. So I, I would not be surprised at all if there were big effects. Um, so I have a question. Um, so there's a lot of um, ongoing research um, investigating uh, the G protein signaling component of a lot of these uh, G coupled protein receptors, mm -hmm. or G, uh, G protein coupled receptors rather. Um, and uh, some studies are showing that um, some of these molecules actually interact directly with the snare complex and, you know, are, are able to affect um, pro uh, vesicle uh, fusion uh, pro uh, uh, probability. Um, I'm wondering how you think um, th these uh, these studies or, or discoveries may affect uh, this model where it's not so much a question of excitability of the membrane, but instead uh, quantal release of vesicle fusion. Um, and, and, and it's going to vary not only um, from region to from brain region to other brain region and uh but but instead maybe uh you could have neighboring cells which are going to be reacting differently not only via their receptor um expression but also via the 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 downstream molecules that may be interacting with these this G protein signaling so I, I just wonder uh what what kind of role do you think that's playing yeah uh, within your model um yeah, that's an awesome question. And um, yeah, bio isn't biology amazing? Um, the, the degrees of freedom that a system has to deal with to create nuance, I think we regularly, regularly underestimate the brilliance and beauty of natural selection. Um, if, there's a, if there's an advantage to be had, biology will find it. Like water on uh, a cracked city pavement, it'll find all the cracks. Um, so I think that 
those mechanisms are extremely important to understand better. I am absolutely ignorant of the details. Um, I think that you could imagine uh, having the ability to control synaptic release probabilities is a huge feature that would be use useful and utilized by a nervous system. Um, it's another layer of complexity though, because in, in some senses, what you'd really like the neuromodulatory system to do for you is to kind of work no matter what, like you kind of want to rain hell or shine nervous system. You don't want the one time that you heard the rustle in the bushes, um, uh, you know, that it actually was the, the tiger to not alert your system to it. So I think there has to be a lot of checks and balances and redundancy. And so if those kinds of subtle mechanisms are at play, I would say they're, in, they're going to be a play in much more precise contexts rather than like whether the system gets activated or not. it would be what you do about it. Um, so that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is um, we recently had this awesome chat with a, a, an image, a researcher at uh, the University of Sydney, Jack, Zach Chatterton, who was talking to us all about this really fascinating epigenetic mechanisms that occur, um, right? Where you, you take a gene and if there's a particular environmental stress, now all of a sudden there's methylation on the gene and it gets expressed less in the next generation or something. Um, it turns out just very recently, there's been a couple nature and science papers showing that individual neurochemical ligands actually epigenetically bind to DNA. They actually covalently bond with it. So the serotonin molecule will come in and bond to the histones um, or a dopamine will, uh, chemical actually come in and bind to a promoter region of a gene. And what they've actually shown in one of the papers, I can dig up the reference because uh, I, I haven't had the chance to read this properly yet, but what Zach was saying was that um, if the dopamine comes in and they block the fact that that dopamine can be bound in a mouse model of addiction, the mouse no longer has withdrawals. So there's an absolutely a, a behavioral effect of the neuromodulatory system impacting your genes directly. That is absolutely mind blowing and beautiful and complicated. And I've got no flipping clue how to take advantage of that information in a model um, because it's so complicated. But of course, biology would use that, right? If you were like in a really, really crappy place and it just continued to be crappy, you don't want to like make a bunch of babies and then have them live there too. That's terrible. Um, you want to move on and you want to go find the new place. And so I think that you can come up with teleological stories for this stuff really easily. Where the rubber hits the road is, can you work out how the mechanism plays out and what cases it's beneficial and what, what cases it's not and how to utilize it. That's a much, much harder problem. Um, and I'm very keen to try to make progress there, but uh, it's like a bit over my head. If you do want to model it, one the, the maybe the low hanging fruit way to do it would be to flesh out some of the details of LTP and LTD or even short term yeah. version, because that, that yeah. would seem to be the first thing to try. But, yeah. but I was gonna say actually is that to step at, at a sort of intermediate level, uh, it's standard and, and understandable to look at these inverted U's and also these opponent processes where you have a push-pull between two um, neurotransmitter systems, for instance. But I have mentioned this in the context of motor control. Have you ever considered or are you aware of behaviors that are like a stiffening, meaning that two things that are opponent processes are both excited at the same time? And so the motor, just to, um, so, so for anyone who doesn't know, you have opponent muscles, right? So that one will cause an extension, another a contraction. But if you want to stiffen a joint, you actually um, contract both the sets of muscles together. And I think that this is an interesting general principle. Uh, I have ideas about how you could use this in competitive networks and in, in those types of attractor networks that Matt showed. But uh, at a broader level, it, it might be interesting to at least look out for either behavioral states or, or more detailed data on this kind of stiffening. So, well, mm. things that seem to be opposed are both happening simultaneously. Yeah, I love it. Um, so one of the things I didn't get a chance to talk about today was the kind of opponency and cooperation of these different arousal system structures. And I think that you're right. I think there's gonna be weird non-linear effects that come out when you start to combine these things together. Um, we've only really started to sort of scratch the surface on this, but you know, acetylcholine and noradrenaline together do not give you acetylcholine, I mean, noradrenaline minus acetylcholine, they give you something different. And maybe that's kind of what you're talking about here is that there's like different features of the system that can occur because of synergies than you would get on either alone. That's hard. <laughs> there's a common theme here, it's complicated. <laughs> you must be tired. So if you want to, uh, if anyone has any more questions uh, or if you want, I'm, I can stop the recording if you want to ask off the record questions. Uh. Yeah, maybe, maybe do that and I'm happy to yeah. stick around for a few more minutes. Okay, yeah. um,